Let's talk a little bit about high traffic versus low traffic optimization because it brings bearing to this discussion about pre-launch and post-launch. Um, low traffic websites can really rely on this pre-launch data. In fact, we want to spend more time on that because our opportunities to use post-launch data, uh, such as A-B testing, uh, are limited. So we'll, we'll invest more of our testing budget our CRO budget on that pre-launch process and make sure that what we're designing and launching is going to perform well because we aren't really going to be able to run a lot of post-launch tests. We still can collect the analytics data and watch the heat maps and all of that delicious stuff. A-B ta testing is off the table. So let's look at one test. This is called a preference test and I'm going to use this to introduce you to uh, usability Hub. This is one of the tools that we use. There are many out there and they are progressing at very high pace. Thank you Moore's Law. Um, but this is one that we use and it uh, makes it very easy for us to take mock-ups and put them in front of panels of people. Um, the Usability Hub recruits people to come look at mock-ups and answer a few questions. And there are many tests uh, about half a dozen tests that you can run on Usability Hub, one of which is the preference test. And the preference test is, is a simple test where you show them two mock-ups and then you ask them questions about the mock-ups, uh, hoping to get their preference. Now in reality, we won't use preference testing very often because, as we know from behavioral science, we don't want data that asks the visitor's opinion. We're asking them to be a, a copywriter or a designer, which they're not. We want them to pretend to be one of our clients and prospects. But as an example of how this works, uh, one of our uh, partner companies had a test and ran this one as a, a preference test. They wanted to know which of these headlines, which of these headers, was going to be more effective for having people sign up for an e-commerce event. Uh, one had the headline, the e-commerce event this year where your heart goes boom boom and your checkout page goes ring ring. Now I like copy like that. I think it wakes up the uh, brain from the kind of standard business fare that we usually get. They wanted to compare it to a header that had this headline, the most anticipated e-commerce event of this year. So which one do you think won? Well, there's more that changed on these images than just the headline. The background image changed, and some things like the size of the, uh, the text also changed. So there are a number of variables here, but they wanted to get a directional uh, guidance on which of these was going to be most successful. So they put it in front of uh, 25 people and asked them their preference, and they saw a widespread. Four of the people chose the, the heart goes boom boom copy and 21 people chose the simpler e-commerce event uh, this year uh, uh, headline, the treatment. This is quite a spread, 16% versus 84%, and I would consider this probably a conclusive test. If this had been 10 for one and 15 for the other, that sort of a spread would not have been considered inclusive. We can use this spread and say that directionally this is probably a good test and that we would go ahead and go with the shorter headline. But you see how we're handicapping the data because we know the rules of behavioral science. Uh, just to give you an idea, this test ran and cost about $2.50 per participant. This is not an expensive test, this little thing. It probably took maybe an hour or two to put together and these tests usually run within an hour. Uh, Usability Hub and businesses like them have large panels that will come and take a look at your, uh, your mock-up. So it doesn't take very long. This can be easily done in an afternoon. Another test is the five second test. I like this one for testing images and headlines on landing pages, for instance. And the way this works is you put a mock-up in front of a panel they get to look at it for five seconds, and then they are asked several questions about it. So it's a great thing to use in situations like this where you have a mix of images and headlines that you want to test. To get more of an A-B test feel, you might put each of these in front of 10 or 25 participants, uh, and then ask them questions about a task. Uh, what do you think this business does? Uh, what would you click on next? 
does this seem to be a credible business? Is this business in one of the following? And list a long list of businesses to see how accurately visitors can pick the answer. And that also gives us some more quantitative data. Here's an example uh, from the folks at Usability Hub where someone used this to get the right cover for a book. This company launched a book called The Little Boy Who Has Lost His Name. And this book did very well, sold half a million copies, I believe, and they were launching a sequel to it. And of course, wanted to have the same success. This was the next book they launched, The Incredible Intergalactic Journey Home. Now, uh, this did not sell as well, and they were wondering why. The first thing they suspected was maybe the cover was not good. Uh, it seems to be in the same style and follows all those rules. So they did a um, test, and they tested several versions of this. And what they found is that this was the design that uh, people preferred. And indeed, when they redid the cover and relaunched the book, it once again was very successful. That's how a five-second test works, and uh, we like those a lot. Five seconds may sound like it's not very long to you, but you'd be surprised how many decisions are made in our brain within hundreds of milliseconds of seeing a page. The next test I want to talk about is the click test. This test allows us to see how well our pages guide our visitors to a solution. They are shown a mock-up and they're asked to uh, click on something in the instructions. This test will not only measure if they're accurate in clicking on the right thing according to the instructions, but also how long it takes them to figure out where to click. This is a company that sells insurance. They wanted people to be able to find the roadside assistance number with no problem. This was the page as it was designed and they did a click test. So if you look down in the lower right corner uh, where the heat map is, you can see that most of the people that were shown this eventually got it right but it took 20 seconds. And you can see that a number of people clicked on other things higher up on the page. Apparently they aren't scrolling. They did a redesign and the roadside assistance you can see down here in the lower left corner, uh, brought it up higher on the page, made the whole page less complex in general. And we would think that this would improve the usability of the page and their ability to find roadside assistance. And they ran another click test and sure enough, they found that almost all the people found the roadside assistance and that it only took five seconds for them to find that. So this, for that particular task, is a better design and I uh, suspect there were great things for this insurance company going forward. The next study I want to talk about is the question test. This is good if you really want someone to uh, absorb a page and give you feedback on that. With the question test, you show them a mock-up and they get to spend as much time as they want while they answer a series of questions from you. The company wanted to know if social proof would make them seem more reputable. So one of the questions they asked was, does this company seem reputable? And on this particular one, this company Stack tested their homepage against a version that had a testimonial from a customer and another one that had uh, logos of their clients. So they're borrowing trust from their clients or borrowing trust from someone who has used the product, uh, one of their customers who gave them a testimonial. So when they tested the homepage, they saw that 66% of the people responded yes to the question, does this company seem credible? When they added the testimonial there below the uh, header, it increased to 71%. And then when they added the logos, the question, does this company seem credible? 83% of the people said yes. So given the rules, I don't know what the sample size of these were, but let's assume that it was somewhere in the range of 25 to 50 people per treatment. I don't know if this spread is large enough for us to say that this was a conclusive test. Again, if we have other evidence uh, or a preference, we might choose the logos since that scored the highest uh, but in terms of the ra the um, range of error on this it's within the range of error and all of these could perform very well moving forward so this is an inconclusive test and it doesn't really tell us the future very well 
If you're interested in testing the layout, we talked a little bit about this when we were developing our landing page. You want to test how well a layout is getting the visitor's eyes through the page and to the most important parts of the page. We can now do eye tracking studies very inexpensively. That camera that's in your laptop is an HD camera, very high resolution, very high frame rates, very high quality images, very high definition, hence the name HD. This means that with this kind of resolution and some smart software, we can tell where people are looking on their screen using just their webcam. So this opens anybody up with an internet connection to being able to be a participant. When we did an eye tracking study back in 2011, we required a very expensive infrared camera, the bar that you see at the bottom under the screen here. Uh, I think that was $5,000 and um, it required some special software running on the computer that was collecting that information from that camera and collating it into an eye tracking database. I think that was $2,500. Plus the time it took for me to sit down and run through all of the, uh, the data, putting it together into visuals that we could then use to present to our clients, it was a significant undertaking. Not to mention that since we were the only ones with a camera, we had to bring people into the office, sit them down, and watch them use this. We had to give them a Starbucks card as a thank you gift. It just took a lot of time and a lot of money to do this. Now we can do it from our seats, sitting at our desks. So here's an example of the sort of thing that you would get from a company called Sticky.ai. They recently got bought by Toby. Uh, they will bring people to look at your mockups and uh, to track their eyes and then deliver you this kind of a uh, report. And you can see over time, uh, everybody started at the same time, where the eyes go, what gets in their way, which offers and which items on the page draw their attention. And you can make decisions like, well, um, this uh, offer over on the left side of the screen, that seemed to be uh, something of interest to them. Maybe we'll move that higher. Maybe we'll get rid of this image in the, in the upper middle because it seems to be blocking people. And do we even need any copy below where the eyes are going? Because not a lot of people are scrolling beyond the, the, uh, the middle of the page. The reports that you get are uh, very helpful. And here's an example of uh, a head-to-head -head that they did. They want to find out who had the best homepage in terms of people seeing this sign up button, Lyft or Uber. Lyft had it in the middle of the page on a pink button. Uber had it over to the left uh, on a blue button. Both of them break the cardinal rule in that the call to action buttons are the same color as uh, other things on the page so they don't really pop out. So they ran them through a panel of eye tracking tests and they put a gate around the buttons to see how many people were actually seeing that part of the page, how much attention was being cast on those things. They found out that uh, Lyft did a better job. 83% of the visitors to their page saw that sign up now button. The uh, only 50% of the folks on the Uber page saw the sign up button. So Uber needs to do some work to make their button more visible. You can use this sort of testing on your pages to verify that your designer is coming in and using his talents to uh, make the important elements on your page visible, discoverable to the visitor. So if we bring all of this together into the design process, you can see how we can do all kinds of studies as we're developing things out. I think this example shows you uh, how this works. And this is a case study from a company called Udemy. They do online training courses. And one of their more successful training courses was this one, Body Language for Entrepreneurs. Uh, this lady taught several classes on how to use nonverbal communications in sales, in investments, uh, and anything that you need to do as a businessman, as an entrepreneur. This was the original landing page, and the goal of this page is to get them to click through and preview the course and sign up. Uh, they wanted to improve the number of clicks on this page, so they went through a process very much like what I'm talking about today. They started at the beginning on the left there with interviews, phone calls, and emails to customers. This was that qualitative information that we love. 
got an idea about what we should be saying and how we should be saying it. Then they went through the process, that pre-launch process, using Qualaroo for on-site surveys, usertesting.com to test people. Usertesting.com differs from Usability Hub in that with usertesting.com, we can actually go in and test live websites. Um, since the website's live, that implies more application on the post-launch phase of our testing. But if we can do uh, prototypes or um, uh, temporary sites, we can actually test user interaction on things like navigation and so forth. They use SurveyMonkey for their surveys, uh, Crazy Egg heat maps on the existing site to see what people were interested in. You saw that it was a pretty uh, crazy page, had a lot of information on it. I can imagine that Crazy Egg was very helpful in seeing where people's mice were moving and clicking. They used a tool called Verify, which is now called Helio, and it's very similar to Usability Hub. has many of those same tests that we talked about, the preference test, the five-second test, the question test. And then they used Google Analytics. Finally, they launched and they used Optimizely to optimize, do an A-B test, to verify that the new page was outperforming the old page. Now, as they went through the process, this was one of the interim pages that they, so they had. Uh, when they went through the process of testing this, they didn't like the data that they got back. They didn't, the, the people were still having trouble understanding what they were supposed to do, where they were supposed to go, etc. So uh, they went back to the drawing board, changed some more things, did some more testing, and found out, found one that they truly did like. And it looks like this. And I picked this one because I think this really is a best practice in terms of how you develop a landing page. Uh, all the key information is above the fold. So they've got the company logo there for proof of trust, a picture of the product. This is a picture of the instructor, um, and uh, she looks very professional and lovely. Uh, it's got the name of the course. It's got uh, a brief description, but then look at the proof points. 56 reviews, and you can click to see all. Over uh, Almost 4,000 students have already enrolled in this. That's great. It's five hours of in-depth study. And we have the pricing, not just the current price, but the old price. And so, wow, we're getting a real deal. Click Now button, the Enroll Now button is right there, dead in center. And if we want to get a little sample, we just click Play. Uh, we can, of course, scroll down, read more information. Who scrolls down? Our methodicals and our humanists, right? And if the competitive sees what will make them better, they will scroll as well. And I think the top of this page does a good job of getting that competitive visitor to go ahead and scroll and become a little bit more methodical. Let's run an experiment. On the call this week, I'm gonna take you through the process of running an experiment on one of the sites I use uh, as a test site. And you get to watch how I, number one, uh, write up the instructions so that the participants are uh, uh, able to pretend that they're a, they're a prospect or a customer for the business that I'm testing and then how to ask questions that aren't leading, uh, that don't introduce biases, and don't ask the participants their opinion of things. Don't ask the participants to be someone that they're not. Here are the general guidelines that we want to follow. Number one, help your participant to pretend to be your prospect. And this includes everything from seeding them with what their price expectations are to uh, giving them a somewhat detailed uh, explanation of who they are in the organization. I find it's better to give them a little bit about that, but really focus on what the problem is. This is very important that you not uh, use words that would lead them to jump to a conclusion about what the best solution is. You don't want to lead them. You want to set them up, let them know what their problem is, and let them know how they got to that web page, and then let them discover whether or not the, the page is right for them. We don't want to ask them their opinion. We don't want to ask them uh, what they think of the design, what they think of the copy. Um, they will vote on that with their uh, accuracy of completing a task or the time it takes for them to complete a task um, or their inaccuracy in answering specific questions. Give them tasks that you can use to decide what their opinion is because if you ask their opinion, they're going to give you uh, really unhelpful information about the design of the copy and there are no place to do that. I also like to include qualifying questions in the questions that I ask. So we set them up, 
uh, with an introduction, help them pretend, we show them the mock-up, we ask them a series of questions, and one of the last questions I'll ask is um, a question that would qualify them potentially. In the case of a wedding planning site where we're developing a landing page, uh, I ask them if they've ever done one of several things. Have they ever been married? Have they ever planned a wedding? Uh, have they ever been in a wedding? Uh, or are they unmarried? And that gives me an idea, someone who has planned a wedding before, their answers are going to be going to carry more weight in my analysis than someone who has never even been in a, mar in a, in a wedding or been married. So think of a good qualifying question. Um, have you worked for a big company before if you're interested in enterprise clients? Have you worked for a small company before if you're interested, if your, uh, your prospects are small businesses? And I think the tools are going to progress where they're going to be able to bring only contestants, participants, who fit a certain set of questions called screening questions. We can get this on usertesting.com today, and I think we'll see more of it uh, on, on sites like Usability Hub and Helio. When you ask questions, you want to try to blind them to what you're really asking. So in a couple situations, in a couple of my examples, I've, I've, not, I've noted that I use a multiple choice list, uh, or a single choice list rather, to hide the answer that I'm looking for. Um, that way, uh, instead of asking them, have you ever worked for a big business, you can say, have, which of these have you worked for? Instead of asking them if they work in the financial services industry, or if they've ever bought financial services, you would ask them if they've ever hired any of these, uh, or any, bought any of these services, and list financial services as one of several. That way you get a much more uh, honest answer. The thing is that our participants want to give us good answers and make us happy, so they will sometimes bend the truth or they'll stretch their past experience to fit uh, because they want to be nice to us. We don't want them to be nice to us. We want their uh, truth. So blinding your visitors to what you're really asking uh, is one of the ways of doing that and helping a participant pretend to be a prospect and give you answers more like a prospect would. That's all the backgrounders for this session. I look forward to seeing you on the call. Be ready to set up a user testing test of your own, uh, and I will uh, talk to you then.